Good evening. I'm Gary Levy, Executive Director of the Temple Amanios Stryker Center, and I'm super excited to welcome you to the start of our fall semester. During the past 18 months, over 500,000 of you have joined us virtually, making our Stryker community stronger. This semester, I invite you to continue doing so, virtually or in person, as major writers and thinkers take on questions about race, education, American culture, anti-Semitism, politics, and Jewish life. As we welcome Hillary Clinton and Henry Kissinger, Ibrahim X. Kendi, George Will, Chris Wallace, Anderson Cooper, and Katie Couric. As we remember Leonard Cohen, eat some latkes together and go back to, to the heights with Lynn manuel Miranda. I hope you will join us regularly. Now to a discussion that could not be more timely. In a recent CNN poll, people were asked how they felt about the state of affairs in our nation. 75% responded that they are pissed off. And we are seeing dead anger explode all over the country. Airplane passengers lash out for almost no reason. Fist fights break over masks at car mines on the Upper West Side and innocent people are pushed off the subway platform in Times Square. We are flooded with conspiracy theories about vaccine carrying microchips and boxes of ballots mysteriously disappearing. Are these, sign, are these signs that we are losing our collective minds? Have we lost our ability to think rationally? There is probably no one better to answer those questions than Dr. Steven Pinker, Professor of Psychology at Harvard, one of Foreign Policy's magazine's top 100 public intellectuals, Times 100 most intellectual people in the world today, and author of 12 books, the latest, Rationality. I hope you can see it. He joins us tonight for a conversation with Rabbi Jeff, Jeff Middleman to talk about the tools we have to be rational, why we often fail to use them, and what we can do about that state of affairs. If you have questions for our guests, please submit them at any time using the chat function. If you have yet to purchase a copy of the book and are interested, you can do so using the link posted now and throughout the program in the chat window. Thank you for joining us tonight, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Steven Pinker and Rabbi Jeff Middleman. Thank you, Gadi. Uh, wonderful to be with you all. Steve, nice to be with you here. Um, I have loved your books and your writing for many, many years and just finished reading Rationality, the fascinating book and an exploration of how and why we act rationally and why we act irrationally. And so since we're through a synagogue, through Temple Emanuel Stryker Center, I want to frame this question, lead into a, a question um, through a well-known story in rabbinic literature called The Oven of Achnai, where two rabbis are arguing over this minute piece of Jewish law, and they're arguing back and forth, and one Rabbi Eliezer keeps saying, if I'm right, let this miracle prove it, so that a stream flows backwards, and a tree flows backwards, and the house of the study falls in, and each time the rabbis say, we don't find any evidence from miracles. We don't look to miracles from, we don't look for miracles for, for evidence here. And finally, Rabbi Eliezer says, look, if I'm right, let God himself come down. And the text says, God comes down and says, why are you arguing? Rabbi Eliezer is always right. And Rabbi Joshua essentially says, God, shut up. You're not part of this conversation anymore. Ever since the Torah has been given to us, it's on us as human beings to be able to interpret these questions and how we're supposed to act. And so why the story is so wonderful is that it makes this claim that really only reasoned arguments using evidence and, and interpretation are accepted. And as Gadi mentioned, and as I know that you've done a lot of work and research on, that's not always been the case throughout human history. It's certainly not the case today. Often it's the loudest voices that, that are heard. So I want to start by asking, why is rationality seemingly so challenging in today's society right now? I, I always resist the leap from things are 
uh, bad today to <clears throat> things used to be better yesterday. The, uh, uh, as Franklin Pierce Adams said, the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. So yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of nonsense going on today, but it, it, uh, it kind of comes with being human. We have, uh, I, I don't want to say that humans are an irrational species. I deliberately chose as this middle part of the subtitle of, of my book, why rationality seems scarce, not necessarily why it is scarce, but the kind of flaws that, uh, and, and indeed dangers that we know today, like uh, conspiracy theories and fake news and belief in paranormal phenomena have, have been with us for as long as we've been human. And of course, protocols of the elders of Zion, the Illuminati, uh, show that conspiracy theories go uh, go way back. If they've triggered pogroms throughout history. So it is a, a constant danger that we humans deal with. I think a better question is, uh, what accounts for the rationality that that, uh, that we see? But there, there are two sides of the, of the same coin, and I'm, I'm not willing to, to write off our species. I'm not willing to write off our era. Well, you know, that, that raises a great question because we sometimes think, and, and you talk about this, that rationality gets a bad rap, and we think of this unemotional Mr. Spock view. And, um, and what I think we often forget is that our brains didn't really evolve to help us find truth. And you talk about this, that they really helped us survive. Our brains were there on the African savanna several hundred thousands of years ago. And so, uh, you know, rationality is relative to a goal, which is something I know you've said. And so what is the job that rationality gets done? And, and what are its limitations also? Yes, yeah, so you, you brought up several points. One of them is that, uh, that uh, we should move beyond the, the, the dichotomy or the tension between reason and emotion, between rationality and you know, love and beauty and all of the valuable things in life, because they're, they're not alternatives. You do not have to be a jo joyless drone to be rational. Uh, rationality is the use of knowledge to pursue a goal. And there's nothing that says that that goal can't be love and good works and beauty and, uh, and richness. It's just that if that's what you want, you use rationality to, uh, to get it. Uh, the, uh, also, the, um, uh, it, it is true that um, the irrationality that we, that we uh, see is easy to blame on our hunter-gatherer uh, ancestors. And as an evolutionary psychologist, I have uh, all too often talked, well, what do you expect of a species that had to chuck spears at antelopes in the savannah? Uh, that's what our uh, intelligence was biologically adapted to. But I start off the book actually with a discussion of how hunter-gatherers deploy their rationality, and they're pretty rational. I, I, I spent some time with uh, one, an expert on the uh, San, formerly called the Bushmen of the Kalahari Desert, who survive in a, a pretty unforgiving desert and have for hundreds of thousands of years. They're probably the world's uh, one of the world's oldest cultures, and um, they uh, they are highly cerebral. They uh, the way that they make a living is that they engage in pursuit hunting. That means you chase an animal until it keels over from exhaustion or heat stroke and you bash it on the head or, or you dispatch it with a, with a, uh, a spear or a bow and arrow. Now, um, uh, you know, animals are faster than we are. Uh, you, know, you, you can't uh, outrun an antelope. Uh, on the other hand, we have an advantage, we're, we're naked. We have bare skin, we're not covered in fur, we sweat. And so in the desert, we can run marathons without getting heat stroke. Antelopes and kudus and, and springboks and so on can't. However, because they can run faster than us, they see us, they're kind of over the horizon. The, the sun's weapon is their intelligence. They look at fragmentary tracks. They can uh, infer uh, both from the shape of the tracks and from background knowledge, what species it's likely to be, how old it is, what sex, uh, how, how tired. Uh, and that allows them to figure out where to go to find it next, which is absolutely crucial to success in the hunt. And I give a lot of examples of how they, they use, uh, they distinguish correlation from causation. They use what we call Bayesian reasoning, that is they implicitly uh, appeal to the, uh, the, the rule of, of uh, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, the optimal way to update um, uh, hypotheses based on evidence. They engage in critical thinking. They, they argue if and they don't accept arguments from authority. So if the hotshot uh, tribal elder says one thing and a young upstart thinks that he's full of it, he'll 
pointed out. Um, so when it comes to human irrationality, I say, don't blame the hunter-gatherers. <laughs> we have to blame ourselves. Now, I think what's crucial, though, of course, is that the uh, the San are applying their intelligence to their the, the world, the, the part of the world they depend on for survival. And when we do that, we can we're perfectly rational. The people who believe in um, crackpot conspiracy theories, you know, a lot of them, some they they hold a job, they get you know, gas in the car, they get the kids clothed and fed and off to school on time, they keep food in the fridge. So it's not as if they're stark raving mad. We have different zones in which we deploy our rationality in, in different regards. Now, the reality zone, you know, just the, the stuff around you, the people that you actually interact with, we, uh, I think we all are pretty rational when it, uh, when it comes to doing that. We, we have to be because reality is what doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. It depends on, it determines our survival, you know, back then and now. But the, Kind of remote, faraway worlds. Who, who, uh, what is the origin of the universe? What happens in in, in the White House when uh, behind closed doors? What's the ultimate cause of fortune and misfortune? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, all of those. Um, you kind of, for most of our history, you kind of couldn't find out, and so it's kind of irrelevant where your whether your beliefs are true or false. Almost academic whether your beliefs are true or false. You hold them because they're. A good story. They're entertaining. They're emboldening. They're, they they increase solidarity in your own tribe, your sect, your political party, your religion. And whether they're true or false is just uh, kind of uh, academic. Now, now here's the what I think is the, is the key that since the Enlightenment, many educated people. Uh, uh, have the conviction that all of our beliefs should be based in the best evidence and arguments. I think it's a commendable attitude. Namely, you shouldn't have any old uh, creation myth. You should really look at what cosmology uh, has to say. And likewise, what happens among the, the rich and, and famous and powerful. Uh, we should look to the historians and the journalists and demand access to records, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a, a kind of a peculiar and very recent conviction. And a lot of people don't, haven't really signed on to it. They're rational in their day-to-day -day lives, their, their bread and butter. But when it comes to these big questions, it's, you know, is, is it a good story? And it's not clear how deep in the bones people actually believe the truth of a number of these, um, uh, uh, the, these crackpot ideas, such as the more outlandish conspiracy theories. You kind of think, well, my enemies, they're capable of it. And, you know, that, uh, of these nefarious deeds, say, running a, 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 a ring of cannibalistic Satan worshiping pedophiles. Whether they, they do or not, uh, the, those Democrats are capable of it, and that's good enough for me. That's, that's the kind of the psychology, I think, behind a lot of those beliefs. Sorry, long answer to a, well, it's a multi part question. It's a multi part question, and there are, there are a few different ways that I want to move, but one that is striking me is that when we talk or think about rationality, I think very often, it's framed as almost like a computer of a zero or one binary, um, is this on, is this off? And I think part of when you were talking about um, the hunter-gatherer societies, that the thing that we often forget is that we are a social species and we've got to balance our needs versus other people's needs. And when you were talking about the hunting, I one line that, that someone said that I love, which is the best place to store food 200,000 years ago was in other people. And you don't know, are, is my hunt going to work? Am I going to be able to find it? Or are they going to be able to find it? If I give you food now, are you going to give it back to me later? Um, am I going to shirk my responsibility? Am I going to, you know, uh, uh, the prisoner's dilemma, am I going to cheat or am I going to cooperate? And so much of, I think, politics and religion and law is designed to be able to say, how do I achieve my particular goals? That's also part of, a larger society where each individual person also has their own particular goals that may be the same as mine and they may be in conflict and they may be together at the same time in cooperation and in conflict. I, uh, so once again, I think you packed at least four questions into that <laughs> question. And, and as it happens, I talk about all of those in rationality. So let me try to answer them succinctly without monopolizing the, uh, the the pixels too long. So yes, logic. So logic, first of all, 
uh, does rationality involve all or none propositions that are either true or false? Well, that's what classical logic deals with since uh, Aristotle. And uh, it, one might wonder, is being perfectly rational the same as being perfectly logical in the sense of thinking in syllogisms? And the answer is it doesn't, that logic is one of the tools of rationality. And the middle part of the book is um, has six chapters, each one of which tries to explain a different tool of rationality. Logic is one of them, and, and we really need it. But the reason that logic isn't the same as rationality is that the whole point of logic is to zero in on the propositions listed on a page and to, do, to deduce the um, necessary consequences of them. Now, that's a powerful thing to do. That's how our computers work. But uh, the reason it's not the same as rationality is, is that logic requires forgetting everything you know and just basing your inference on what's stated on the page. In the real world, rationality often involves lots and lots of probabilistic, uncertain knowledge, which we have to aggregate. We sometimes call it common sense or common sense uh, refined. Uh, but um, just as an example, the, uh, the syllogism, uh, all, uh, all things derived from plants are healthful. Uh, tobacco is derived from plants, therefore tobacco is healthful. Now, that is a valid um, logical deduction. It would not be rational to endorse the conclusion because we know from our knowledge of all the different kinds of plant products that the first premise, uh, all plant products are healthful, is you know, largely but not exactly true. It has some important exceptions. And all of these exceptions to the rule and a uh, you know, little consideration pushing you this way or that way are what are, is hard to capture in logic. That, that's one of the reasons that I have a chapter on uh, Bayesian reasoning. I, I mentioned it earlier because the, the San do it. Uh, namely, you adjust your credence in a hypothesis, your degree of confidence, uh, up or down, depending on the uh, evidence you've just received. And that's another tool of rationality. The okay, second thing, uh, Rabbi, that you brought up was uh, yeah, we are a social species. And that, too, is, a, is critical to what makes us rational when we are rational. Now, none of us is infallible, none of us is omniscient, none of us has been vouchsafed um, with the truth by, uh, um, by Hashem, by the, uh, the Almighty. Uh, we are fallible humans, and we are indeed uh, saddled with all of the biases and fallacies and errors that cognitive psychologists, my colleagues, have, have documented uh, for, uh, for, for more than 50 years, most famously Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman uh, won a Nobel Prize for research that he is familiar probably to many of you from his bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, Tversky uh, tragically um, died bef um, before the Nobel Prize could be awarded. But um, so we are, every one of us, subject to all of these uh, these fallacies. Nonetheless, you know, we, we've accomplished great things. We discovered you know, the Big Bang and DNA and neural networks and invented vaccines and smartphones and walked on the moon. So we can't be that stupid either. And the, the uh, reason that we uh, fallible creatures do attain rationality when we do is, is that we cooperate in, um, in, in, in communities of uh, reason. And crucially, those communities allow the voicing of ideas, many of which are going to be wrong because we are fallible, and the ability to criticize them and to uh, keep the ones that survive attempts to refute them, uh, to aggregate them, to compose bigger ideas out of smaller ideas. That's one of the reasons, probably the main reason, that we evolved language so that we could pool our ideas, so we could criticize other people's ideas. And it's only in... Um, uh, arenas or, or games that we choose to play where we allow feedback and editing and fact-checking and peer review and free speech, that we have any hope of becoming uh, more rational. One person's rationality can make up for another's uh, irrationality. Uh, the, you brought up the prisoner's dilemma. This is a game theoretic dilemma. There's, I have a chapter in the book on game theory, which is the how we make sense of uh, situations in which 
the best rational option for one person depends on what the other guy chooses to do and vice versa. It can make your head spin, but there are interesting results, including the paradox that sometimes everyone doing what is rational for himself or herself can end up with a situation that's irrational for everyone put together. And indeed, that happens with rationality. I call it the tragedy, tragedy of the rationality commons, a play on the classic tragedy of the commons, the situation where you know, every shepherd has an incentive to graze his sheep on the town commons because it's better to have the sheep uh, munch there than not. But when everyone does it, they can strip the commons bare and everyone ends up worse off. So it's good for one is not necessarily good for everyone. In the case of the rationality commons, it can often be make perfect sense uh, if your goal is to be a hero of your tribe, your team, your coalition, your, your political party. Uh, if you uh, prosecute the fiercest possible battle in, for your team against the other team, you, you own the libs, you show why the, the, the Republicans are stupid or evil, uh, you muster all the ammunition you can do it, and you know, you're a hero within your tribe. And, in, uh, on the, uh, and conversely, if you were to entertain some doubt about the sacred beliefs in your clique, in your social circle, you could be ostracized um, and uh, you know, socially excommunicated. So it's rational for everyone to advance the sacred myths, the, uh, the dogmas of their tribe. It's not rational for all of us put together when you've got two wars cliques, each of which is doing everything in its power to, to win the debate as opposed to determine uh, uh, what's true. Uh, finally, you talked about conflicts among goals. Now, getting back to our definition of rationality, it's the use of knowledge and a goal. Now, different people can have different goals, and the goals may be in conflict. And a lot of what we call ethics, morality, is how we can reason about uh, what to do when people's goals come into conflict as necessarily they often do. Okay, that's at least four answers to four questions packed there's a, together. There's a lot in there, and there may be a lot in this in this next one too, that um, that I think one of the things that's, that's important is recognizing that morality also has a rational basis of this, that, that um, I, I think in, in one of your other books that you talk about how uh, the, the prisoner's dilemma and tit for tat and this balance of, of justice and mercy in the individual and the collective, that can help us understand almost every part of these moral emotions of justice and forgiveness and shame and guilt, which become huge, at least in Judaism and obviously other religions as well, but we're here at a synagogue, so we'll talk about it from a Jewish perspective. And it's, you know, it's the, the line of someone wants to convert to Judaism and goes to Rabbi Hillel and says, teach me the whole Torah while, while standing on one foot. And, and Hillel says, what's hateful to you, do not do to another. That's the whole Torah. Now go and learn it. And, and what most people say is, oh, that's great. You know, what's hateful to you, don't do to another. That's the whole Torah. And what we forget is the, now the rest is commentary, go and learn it. You've got to know what are the edge cases? How am I, how am I going to manifest these kinds of questions in these specific situations where, um, you know, I think it was Paul Rude Wolpe who said, ethics is not questions of right versus wrong, it's right versus right. And it's often these questions of morality and competing values where we can then start to think, this is what I need to be able to do on this, on this case where it's on the border, I'm not quite sure what to do here. Yes, so let's see. Um, well, the, the story about Rabbi Hillel, I actually have in Rationality or the, uh, the excellent reason that it does capture the, the core of, of uh, morality, uh, which is some version of the golden rule, the categorical imperative, Spinoza's um, uh, viewpoint of eternity. I like Rabbi Hillel's formulation uh, because it's, it uh, skirts uh, George Bernard Shaw's objection to the golden rule. Do not do other, unto others as they would have uh, you do unto them. They may have different tastes. Now, if it's what's hateful to you, don't do unto others, you're probably on firmer ground because there are more things that people have in common that they don't want done unto them that, that do. But putting that aside, sometimes called the, the, uh, the, the, the silver rule, uh, it is true, uh, and this is part of the answer to the 
challenge to rationality that can actually get you morality. Is morality in some separate sphere where reason um, has, has nothing to say? You just have to uh, look at what's uh, carved onto the tablets that was handed down by an all merciful God? Or do we mortal humans get to uh, figure it out? Uh, the cliche is you can't get an ought from an is. It's often attributed to David Hume and the series of philosophers that he inspired. And it is technically true, but on, on pretty narrow grounds. It's true that, uh, as Hume put it, um, there is no logical reason to prefer, uh, if given the choice, you can, um, there can be a, a, a scratch on your finger or you save a million people from genocide. And, you know, logically, there's no argument for one another. Now, it's not that Hume was a psychopath. <laughs> he himself knew you really should ex uh, accept the scratch on your finger. Um, but he just pointed out it's not a matter of logic. Well, okay. Uh, and it's also not a matter of logic that you should prefer to be happy than sad or healthy than sick or, or, or uh, uh, comfortable rather than poor. And, and Hume noted that as well. But if you combine the not logical, but uh, inescapable preference of self-interest, that good things happen to you rather than bad things happen to you, number one. If you also accept the fact that we are a social species, as we are, none of us is a galactic overlord that can just impose our will on the universe. We depend on the um, actions of other people. Well, that changes everything, and a lot falls from it, including uh, as soon as I say, hey, I don't want you to be uh, stepping on my foot or, or, or uh, harming my children or stealing my food. I can't, by the same token, say, yeah, but it's okay if I steal your food or if I step on your foot. There's got to be reciprocity because there is nothing in the pronoun me versus you that means anything. Uh, I can't say, do what's good for me because I'm me and you're not. You'll just walk away. If I want you to, to persuade you of anything, uh, granted, I don't have to, but as soon as I start playing the game, certain things follow. Like we have to, uh, if we want to affect our each other's behavior, which we do because we can hurt each other, then we've got to agree on a set of rules that uh, works um, regardless of whose interests they are. And hence you get Rabbi Hillel's version of the uh, the golden rule and the categorical imperative and the veil of ignorance and a lot of other statements of uh, morality. Um, granted, the rest is commentary. So you are, you're certainly right that there are uh, edge cases, there are principles that come into conflict. And that's the stuff of uh, moral argumentation as uh, generations of um, yeshiva students and, and rabbis and their secular uh, descendants know uh, all, all too well. Um, I won't talk right for now about moral emotions. You brought that up as well. Why do we feel shame and guilt and righteous anger and so on? Um, maybe a topic for later, uh, uh, turning the conversation. Well, I want to come back to, to something that you mentioned of this, this idea of not coming from a privileged place of just because I'm me and you're you, if I were to flip that around, I, I, yeah, it, it's, like, it's the categorical imperative. And, and the rabbis actually talk about this. That there's a debate of what's the greatest commandment in the in the Torah, and one says, "Love your neighbor as yourself." They don't go with with Hillel; they go with with Leviticus of "Love your neighbor as yourself." And another says, "No, it's actually that we're all created in the image of God." That it's actually this is the descendants of, of Adam is how it's phrased. And we, you know, depending on people's theology and reading of, of the Torah, we could say that as everyone has value as a human being simply by the virtue of being a human being. There is there are values and rights there, and and that draws that distinction between um, the relative nature of what I like may not be what you like. If you love your neighbor as yourself, if I don't really love myself, then I may not be be treating my neighbor very well. Versus like what what Paul Bloom sometimes talked about about against empathy, right? You've got a, the distinction between empathy and compassion. Of I need to be compassionate towards people um, because of who they are. And I think that's a large part of the rationality of being able to say, I'm going to come at it from a, from a, a, a 30,000 foot perspective than, than on the ground right now. Yes. So, so again, a number of issues have been brought up. Uh, you know, one, the, the problem, of course, with the um, image of God uh, argument or for simply saying that we have uh, rights because we are human, it's, it's a very good starting point. But the 
uh, the, the people who defend the interests of animals will come at you if, if that's the only basis of your uh, of morality, because it would say, well, we can do whatever we want with animals. We can, you know, torture them and, and uh, uh, eat, eat them for our interest or do with them as we will. And of course, it has been a criticism of the Judeo-Christian tradition that it does not carve out enough of a uh, space for the interests of animals. The Perhaps the, the higher order principle is that other animals are sentient, they can feel pleasure or pain, they can, they can flourish, and um, not, not indis- um, uh, interchangeably with those of humans, but not zero uh, either. So that the ultimate basis of morality is, you know, I can, uh, that, that, um, by the same token that I don't think it's okay to torture me, it can't be okay to torture some other sentient creature. Uh, it, it is also true that empathy in the sense, uh, empathy is a, is a word with a number of, uh, of meanings and, and I distinguish them and, and kind of anticipate Paul's, uh, Paul Bloom's argument in, in my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. It's a, a discussion that goes back to Adam Smith that um, empathy can mean putting yourself in someone's shoes and seeing the world from their point of view, feeling their pain. Um, it can also mean just caring about their well-being. Even if you have no idea what it's like to be them, you know at a kind of cognitive level that they're capable of pain, and you know that that would be a, a bad thing. And indeed, you don't always want empathy if, you, if your ultimate concern is um, the well-being of others. So if you're, you know, if a dog lunges at your a uh, five-year-old child and the child is you know, howling in terror, what you should do is not howl in terror <laughs> to, to feel what the child is feeling. You should protect and comfort the child. Uh, that, you know, that's a case that shows them that they are empathy and compassion, as, as Bloom um, brilliantly explains, are, are not the same thing. I, I want to shift to a, a slightly different question and look at a, another word that, that comes up, and the word is trust. Um, and in Hebrew, the, the word is emunah, which is often translated as faith. But I think a better word is trust. And I think that the trust and rationality go hand in hand in a lot of ways, because uh, so much of, of what we understand today is, is wisdom that's been handed down over thousands of years and, um, and, and particularly over the last hundreds of years. Right. We, you know, the vaccines for COVID-19 have happened in the last year, year and a half. And and a this question has is, is really arisen in our society of, of do we trust our leaders? Do we trust institutions? There's a lack of trust now in religious institutions. There's a trust, lack of trust in scientific institutions. There's a lack of trust in journalistic institutions. And, and sometimes the, the trust allows us to sort of have a cognitive offload. Um, you know, one reason that I think people don't, when they say, I don't trust the vaccines, I'm going to do my own research, whatever that means. Um, there's that, that's a lot more cognitive work rather than I'm going to trust the people who have used the tools that we've had for thousands of years to be able to advance human flourishing. So how do we, how do we regain a level of, of trust and, and what's the connection between a level of trust and a level of, of rationality of being able to, to be able to, to believe in the institutions that we want to believe in? Uh, indeed, and I guess it's fitting that we're talking about Trust Emuna at an event organized by Temple Emmanuel, right. uh, which I assume means uh, trust in God. Uh, uh, but it is a pointed issue because we are living right now in an era in which lack of trust in science is uh, killing people and, and people who are <coughs> irrationally resisting vaccines. But um, you know, on the other hand, trust has to be earned. And the thing about science, and here I'm, I, I represent, I'm going to try to represent my scientific colleagues. And of course, uh, uh, Jeff, Rabbi, you are uh, uh, involved in uh, Sinai, Sinai and synapses, synapses yep. and Sinai. So bringing Sinai and synapses, yep. <laughs> religion and science together. But the thing, the, the crucial thing is, why should we trust science? And the answer mm-hmm. is not, well, they are another you know, white, white robed priesthood or white coated priesthood and what they say goes. Because that, that does violence to the concept of, sci- of science and to the reason that we should trust science when we should trust it. And the reason is that that trust is earned. 
and it is earned not not just by a track record, although that counts. I mean, it really was science that uh, decimated the rate of infant mortality and um, in death from infectious disease and that got us to the moon and, and, and all the other accomplishments. So, But that's just saying that they're kind of wizards who have a really powerful form of magic. No, the real reason that we should trust the institutions that we should trust is that we can, uh, they can show their work. We can, when we peer behind the curtain, we don't see more curtains, but rather methods that actually are designed to uh, sift truth from falsehood, such as empirical testing in science, such as fact-checking and source verification in journalism, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, it is a mistake to just say, whatever the, the, the people in the white coat say, I'm going to do it. Um, I mean, I think in general, we should, not because uh, science is just a, a new priesthood, but because if we ever press them, what is the basis for your recommendations? They can tell us, and we can, if we're prepared to put in the work, we can retrace their steps and understand it. I think scientists make a big mistake when they deliver authoritative pronouncements uh, as if they are oracles or they have been vouchsafed with, uh, with, with re revelation. It's even worse when scientists, as they sometimes do, um, tell their critics to just, you know, to, to shut up, to go away, to cancel them. That is tantamount to saying that we are, uh, our authority comes from, from raw power. Mm -hmm. uh, the authority of scientists, to the extent they have it, come from a track record and from transparent methods that anyone can um, check, check for themselves. And we know that it's trust in science that makes the difference in a lot of scientifically contentious beliefs, because the surveys show that the, a lot of what we call science denial, uh, say climate change or evolution, does not come from scientific ignorance. And indeed, it's a rather depressing finding that if you give tests of scientific literacy to believers in human-made clim climate change and deniers, to creationists and to people who um, uh, endorse the um, conclusion that, that humans adopt, uh, evolved from primates, neither one on average knows more science than the other. And in fact, if you probe your typical person who has the correct belief in climate change of what, what actually causes it, you'll get all kinds of comical beliefs like, oh, it doesn't have something to do with the ozone hole or you know, toxic waste dumps or plastic straws in the ocean. Uh, most people, even when they're on the right side, are kind of clueless as to the actual science. They have a general sense of you know, green is good and pollution is bad, which may have nothing to do with climate change. The thing that predicts climate change is your politics. Uh, the farther you are to the right, the more you deny climate change, which goes with skepticism about the scientific establishment, not helped by the fact that scientists, many scientists and scientific societies kind of brand themselves as wings of, uh, of, of uh, left, leftist politics. Um, I think science does itself a disservice when it just uh, uh, aligns itself with a political faction. It should cultivate and, and should actually have a uh, deserved reputation for political um, neutrality to the extent that it can uh, muster that uh, and should be able always to um, provide reasons for its recommendations, reasons in the form of data and arguments. And you know the the word that that comes up that that drives me nuts on both a scientific perspective and a religious perspective is when the word believe comes in uh, on the scientific level. Like, do you believe in evolution? Do you believe in climate change? And I think that's a terrible question because well, I, I I cite the great Jewish sage Fran Lebowitz who said, mm -hmm. "I don't I don't I don't believe in anything you have to believe in." Right, right. And but what's what's interesting is that on the Jewish side, I also don't like the question of, "Do you believe in God?" Um, because that it, it leaves this question of it in the same way of do you believe in evolution or climate change? It's a yes or a no question of do you believe in God is a yes or a no. But being able to open up these kinds of questions to probe and to be able to use, um, I think, a level of rationality. And I also think a level of what I might call charity of, of being able to say, I am going to assume that you have a reason for the way that you're acting. I, I am going to come at, at this thinking that, that you you are acting rationally within your own worldview. 
and let me at least explore what's driving this what's driving this belief what are the implications of this belief how does it how is it going to manifest itself in your day-to-day life and on the societal level as well uh, indeed, and, and uh, since you bring up belief, I'm in a great rabbinical tradition of always bringing in a, a, an anecdote or a story uh, that, that, that touches on the topic of conversation. I'll have to quote my, uh, my late colleague, the great sociologist Daniel Bell, who said that when he was uh, 13, he went to and taking, uh, preparing for his bar mitzvah, he went to the, uh, his rabbi and he said, uh, Rabbi, I've given it deep thought. I have, I, I've pondered it. I've searched my soul and I've just um, uh, concluded, I, I just, I, I don't believe that uh, God exists. And the rabbi said, you think God cares? <laughs> uh, but when it comes to, you raise another point when it comes to uh, kind of you know, respect and a presumption of rationality in the people who disagree with us. Um, so that is, it is essential that, um, that, that, that there be two rules of this game of discourse that, that we, we engage in when we do science or legal argumentation or, or um, uh, political argumentation, matters of uh, uh, the factual record. Um, one is that uh, <clears throat> there is a truth. That is, it's not that everyone has a right to, to their own opinion and all opinions count uh, equally and uh, it's just a matter of power whose opinion pre- prevails. I think rational discussions have to proceed from the assumption that the truth exists, but equally crucially, they have to proceed from the assumption that no one knows it, at least not for sure. People have different degrees of warrant in their belief, depending on how much evidence they adduce, depending on the cogency of their arguments. Uh, But no one uh, can stake a claim to have the truth. They can do their best to persuade other people of the truth. This is the reason why that uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, academic uh, inquiry are so vital that um, no one um, uh, has enough of a claim to the truth to impose it on others and shut down debate. At the same time, we can't accept any old cockamamie uh, belief. Uh, we have to uh, demand the the, uh, the evidence, always being tentative and provisional, always searching for more evidence, but um, but always trying to refine our belief so it's as close to the truth as we humans can uh, uh, can make it, given the evidence we have. The line that I love is science is helping us become progressively less wrong. Um, so there were some wonderful questions that came up. I want to shift to, to some of the Q&A that, that came up here. Um, and this actually came from, from several people. Um, so one is that we all watched as hundreds of thousands of people died from the current pandemic. And yet people are avoiding getting vaccinated due to their own rationalization. And I like that the word is rationalization because Rational and rationalization can be it's a fine line there sometimes. So how can the country be so split about helping ourselves and others? Yeah, even as someone who uh, wrote a lot about you know, ration, rationality and especially irrationality, I've got to say that the degree of vaccine resistance uh, surprised me. Not that it exists. People have resisted vaccines for as long as there were vaccines. Jenner faced massive uh, uh, ridicule and, and denunciation in, in his time. The original um, variolation from um, uh, cowpox um, uh, pustules led to editorial cartoons where you know cows were growing out of people's arms and shoulders and thighs. Uh, it was considered preposterous that you would actually take little bits of you know, germ, little, the, the, the thing that actually gives you the disease, and inject it into people's arms. There's something deeply unintuitive about vaccines. Um, so it isn't surprising that there should be some squeamishness. What is surprising is that it, you know, 250 years later, it, it not only should persist, but uh, it should be so consequential. It's, uh, I think, a multiplication of our um, intuitive primitive squeamishness about um, the, the concept of injecting a contaminant, a pollutant, an adulterant into our own, into the tissues of our own body. Um, so the, the, the intuitive odds are stacked against a vaccination in the first place. Um, most of us unlearn that primitive intuition because we do trust the people in, in the white coats. They've, they, 
uh, extinguished smallpox. They've drastically reduced the the terror of polio from from even when when, when I was a, a, an infant. So we uh, see their track record. We uh, trust what they have to say. The resistance shows there are an awful lot of people who don't trust what scientists have to say. Plus, um, uh, in a, a strange turn of events, the Republican Party, the American right, adopted vaccine resistance as one of their sacred beliefs. And um, uh, firing up perhaps the most powerful of all of the biases documented by cognitive psychologists, that being the my side bias. Namely, you believe what is accepted, prestigious, sacred in your own coalition, uh, what differentiates you from the other side's coalition, and we're seeing that um, uh, uh, explode in the um, resistance to vaccines among the uh, uh, American right. They're not the only ones who resist it, and there is a kind of left-wing green uh, anti-vax campaign uh, pushed, among others, by, by Robert Kennedy Jr., of all people. Uh, but the, uh, the the strongest resistance comes from uh, the, the populist right right now. And, you know, that, when you were talking about the question of sacred values, that was a question I really wanted to explore. How do we how do we talk about both trade-offs versus sacred values, but but I want to get to these, uh, so a couple of these other questions that are here. Um, another one that's that's very linked to our politics right now, the military claimed they used a drone to kill ISIS leaders in Afghanistan, claiming they acted rationally in basing this action on facts, yet they were totally wrong. How do you deal with such failures in claiming your opponents are not rational? Yeah, it's... Um... It, it itself may or may not be rational, and it's ultimately the best rationality that is the way we, we, we adjudicate it or settle it. The fact that sometimes I hear it used as a criticism of rationality, that so-and-so said they were rational and did monstrous things uh, or were flat wrong. And indeed, that can happen. The fact that someone claims to be rational doesn't mean that they are rational. And it's not an indictment of rationality if someone dons the mantle of rationality, but, but don't have the good, uh, don't have the goods. Uh, how, and the reason it's not an indictment of rationality is that it's ultimately only rationality that allows us to say they were mistaken when they claim to be rational. What allows us to say it? Well, we're applying rationality to their beliefs and showing that it, it falls short. The, uh, the, the power of rationality is it can always step back and look at instances of itself. We can get better and, and better at applying rationality. We can come to discover that what we thought was rational wasn't uh, so rational. But it's nothing but rationality that allows us to do that. But rationality is recursive. It can take itself as the uh, topic of analysis. Yeah, and I, I mean that's that's what's so challenging, but also so powerful, being able to use that tool to be able to look at itself um, and use that as as the as the yardstick. Um, there's another question that came up, which is asking how your work connects to the work of behavioral economists. And I know that that Kahneman and Tversky um, have done a lot of this work. How does your work? relate to the work of behavioral economists, which could be read to indicate that striving to be perfectly rational may be inferior to acting reasonably. Yes. Well, as a, as a cognitive psychologist, I, I'd rather claim that work for, for, for my field because what, uh, what a lot of behavioral economics is, is uh, uh, done by and extends work of cognitive psychology, uh, including Daniel Kahneman, one of the founders of behavioral economics himself, who was trained and, and uh, 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 carries the chair of a, a psychologist. Uh, the, the, my book very much um, discusses discusses ideas that are called behavioral uh, economics, uh, not just how we estimate uh, probability, how we make decision makings under uncertainty and risk, whether the uh, axioms of rational choice actually describe uh, uh, human behavior, um, whether uh, how people behave in, in the situations described by game theory. So really the Behavioral economics and cognitive psychology are are are, are quite enmeshed. Now, of course, behavioral economics is not itself a theory, so it's not that I 
you know, endorse or criticize behavioral economics because it's just a, a topic, a subject matter. Um, but it's one of the things that have made uh, the, the field of something called judgment and decision making, but it's what has often brought it to the uh, uh, public attention. Also, there's a Nobel Prize in economics. There's no Nobel Prize in psychology. So for a lot of uh, psychologists like uh, Kahneman uh, and, and others, their, their, their hope for a Nobel is uh, calling themselves behavioral economists. And be able to get that wonderful prize. <laughs> so, so, so there's another question that I think is interesting, linking back to what we talked about at the beginning with, with the hunter-gatherers. Uh, in what way are looking at hunter-gatherers um, and, and the world as a whole somewhat of a Rorschach test for us? Um, there's enough ambiguity on all of these different things that we can unknowingly project aspects of our own psychology onto them, like nature red in tooth and claw. Well, there, there indeed is that danger, and so it's it's critical to have a uh, the broadest possible view of the the lives of uh, the lifestyle of hunter gatherers. So we aren't cherry picking the aspect that does ratify whatever we believed in the first place. It's critical also to look at to the extent that we can get it to, at, at data. That is, uh, you know, are they? You know, are, are, was Rousseau right in talking about the noble savage? Was Hobbes right in talking about a war of all against all and life in a state of nature, nasty, brutish, and short? Well, there's. it's not that either one were right or wrong. You, you really have to count and to, say, compare rates of death from violence in their societies uh, to ours, to look at the whole diversity of hunter-gatherer and more generally non-state societies, including horticulturalists and pastoralists, um, so that we can be a little more precise and, and therefore escape the trap of using them to ratify whatever we want to be true in our nature. We also have to ask the question of whether it is only um, the uh, most conspicuous hunter-gatherers, like, like the San, um, uh, like the Hazda of, uh, of Tanzania, that really do represent the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, that is the kind of lifestyle in which our genes were largely selected. Because we are getting a biased sample when we look at surviving hunter-gatherers, namely they're the ones that have been pushed into land that no one else wants, that uh, land, basically land that you can't farm. And so the egalitarianism, the um, cooperation, the, the, the pacifism may itself be something of an artifact of who gets to survive as a hunter-gatherer as opposed to being uh, absorbed or conquered or evolving into a, uh, an agricultural society. Yeah, and 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 taking also the shift from hunter gatherer to society and cities and agriculture and you know that and and how much the world changed from two hundred thousand years ago, you know, it always kind of blows my mind that that Homo sapiens came in the African savanna two hundred thousand years ago, two hundred fifty thousand years ago, um, but the Ice Age and, and the rise of cities and agriculture was only. 10,000 years, 12,000 years old. So, so much of human history was before written language, before agriculture, before um, these large scale societies. We were able to, to connect on a smaller level and you could know who could I trust, who could I not trust, um, what are, who am I interacting with? Um, and, and that's so much of our history as Homo sapiens that that always kind of blows my mind when I think about that. It is, although we have to add, and this is, I think we're in the midst of a change in our understanding of the uh, environment of, of evolutionary adaptedness. Uh, the, the traditional story is, is almost like kind of a fall from Eden. In fact, there's a theory that the story of Eden is a historical memory of the transition from small scale, mobile, egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands to more uh, settled and stratified societies with the rise of agriculture. It turns out that's probably a little that dichotomy is, is too simplistic and because of the survivorship bias, the, the sampling bias of the hunter-gatherers today, that the archaeological and ethnographic record shows that there were actually some pretty large um, societies going back uh, tens of thousands of years that had that, that were settled, that had uh, quite rich and, and varied um, uh, diets that engaged in cultivation and horticulture that were stratified. Some of them kept slaves. Uh, even anthropology students have been told about the Kwakiutl and the um, uh, natives of the Pacific Northwest, which uh, kind of contradict the 
picture of ancestral humans as small, mobile, egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands. And probably a lot more of our ancestors were like the Kwakiutl than, than like the San. This is going to be the topic of a forthcoming uh, book by a former uh, student of mine, the anthropologist Manvir Singh. But anyway, uh, uh, it's just a transition that we, in understanding we may be living through now. That's fascinating. That's, I, I, I was not aware of that. It's, that's interesting. And, you know, when you talk about the, the fall from Eden, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of um, the story of Cain and Abel, where which Cain is a is a farmer and Abel is a is a shepherd and Cain kills Abel. And it may be a representation of the 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 uh, the agriculturalists ultimately drove out the the shepherds and the hunter gatherers and that they one type of lifestyle tended to die out more than the other but and uh, it, Esau and Jacob is probably yeah. even more pointed because Cain and Abel it was kind of pastoralist versus farmer uh, but uh, you know Jacob and his brother they were talking about a, a hunter right right well that's so so this leads I think this will be the the last question here which is very interesting and challenging question which is how does one rationally demonstrate that life is an, is an entitlement of transcendent value? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to step back and say, define transcendent value. Um, but there are certain things that are just uh, inherent to even being able to ask the question. You've got to be alive and not dead. You've got to be uh, to have health and not be sick. You've got to have knowledge and not be ignorant. You've got to have rational faculties. Um, these are things that make it possible even for us to ask the question, to think the thought, to conceive of the, uh, the, the, the discussion. And that makes them transcendent. That means that they kind of rise above our particular uh, embodiment. And it, it, it uh, kind of makes you think that, there are values like life and knowledge and flourishing that are beyond what happens to be good uh, you know, ju just for me or, or, or just for you. And once you say that knowledge and understanding and reason are uh, in, uh, inherent, essential, inescapable, uh, that, of course, opens up a universe of um, uh, ideas to explore. And that rationality is this wonderful tool that is, it's almost like a Swiss army knife that can be used in so many different ways to enhance material goodness and, and what we're able to have the, uh, an increase of rights, an increase of flourishing, an increase of, of our, even our lifespan. And I think that's, that's such a critical thing that's, that, that we really need to, to reclaim. Um, so Thank you so much for both taking the time here this evening and for, for writing such an excellent and important book for everybody to be able to read. Uh, thank you, Jeff, Rabbi Middleman, for, uh, for, for a, a delightful conversation. And thanks to Temple Emmanuel. Thank, thank you, you all. And, and, and thank you all for, okay, so you go. Oh, I was going to say that, that I was going to plug that actually tomorrow night at the Stryker Center is uh, a friend of mine um, who has done some wonderful work. And Steve, I know you know him, um, Dr. David DeSteno, who has a new book out called How God Works, uh, which is another great conversation about science and religion. So um, I, I want to encourage everyone to be able to come to that because Dave is also a wonderful thinker and another way to think about this interplay of religion and science. Thank you, Levi. Thank you, Dr. Pinker. Thank you all for being with us tonight. See you soon. Good night. Sure. Good night. Thank you.